Thank you for joining us tonight. It is Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, and we are so grateful that you are with us. And we've been laughing and cutting it up already, getting ready for uh, the study this evening. And uh, we're just glad that you're able to be with us tonight. And I want to introduce the uh, individuals that I have with me at the table. I'm going to start over here with Mr. Eller. This is Scott Eller. Uh, normally on Wednesday nights, he is in one of the Royal Ranger classrooms helping us with uh, boys. What, what age group do you High typically... I remember, use that High mic. school boys. Yeah, everybody wants to hear you, man, yeah. so don't forget. Don't forget. High school boys, so that's never a rambunctious class, I can imagine. Not once are they ever wound up. They come in. Manners are always followed to a T. Um, yeah, complete opposite. I don't know that they have any manners, <laughs> and they are always, it just seems like they find a little bit extra energy when they come in on awesome. Wednesday night. But. Awesome. Well, we're glad that you're with us uh, for this uh, journey in Revelation. Then uh, Pastor Carly. Uh, our youth and worship pastor. Uh, you guys see her quite a bit uh, around the church and stuff. But uh, normally on Wednesday nights, you are in which class? The friends class. The friends class? Yes, the middle school girls. Awesome. So awesome. It's always very calm. Just like Scott's class, they walk in, they sit down, and they say, please, we just want to listen to this lesson and not joke around that's, at all. That's awesome. awesome. Very serious group of Man, girls. I wish I could get the adults to be that. I know. You know I know. It's usually... But, you know, you, you train up a child in the way they should go, and maybe in 10 years you'll have that. There you, you go. Know? There you go. That's right. That's right. And my wife, Christy Baker, who uh, helps out in all different areas, she, depending on what's going on on, on a Wednesday night, you might be in the adult class, you might be in a classroom helping out. Yeah, you, you can say something. There you go. There you go. She's looking at me like, I don't want to talk. <laughs> so, uh, but we're, we're here. To the, the, the object of this, of this uh, broadcast is to continue our lessons through the book of Revelation. And if you're just now joining us, I'm going to talk about some uh, ways that you can catch up with uh, that study here in just a moment. Uh, but before we get there, we want to pray and ask God to be with us uh, this evening as we are looking at this material. And so would you bow your hearts and heads with us today as we just ask God to guide us in our study tonight. Lord, we thank you for this amazing time and this opportunity to be able to connect in this way, God, uh, where we are temporarily having to close our doors to large gatherings. I am so thankful that we have this, this opportunity to be able to gather in our living rooms and to study the Word of God. I pray that your anointing would be upon this study, God, that you would be with us around this table as we, as we dive into this material of Revelation chapter 14. And God, we lift up this nation to you. We lift up our world to you, God, who's going through this uh, virus situation. We just pray right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that you would, you would bring healing God, that you would protect the most vulnerable. God, that you would give anointing to our national and global leadership and how to deal with this pandemic. God, that you would shower, just, just pour out your, your peace and your comfort, Lord, uh, up, upon the, the, the people of this world, God, through this situation. Lord, help there not to be panic, but peace, God, because of your hand that is with us. And Lord, we also want to just pay, uh, pray a special prayer for the Bowden family today, God, that your hand would be with them, that you would guide and direct them, uh, Lord, in these next several days to come. Wrap your loving arms around them, Lord, in this season of grief, and uh, continue to bless them in Jesus' name. And God, again, as we get into Revelation, bless us. May your power be with us, God, as we explore this material. In your mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Well, a couple quick things uh, that we just want to cover uh, Wednesday nights, typically we take prayer requests. Uh, every Wednesday night we do that, and it's something that we are a big believer in because we believe in the power of prayer. And so although you are a distance away, you know, we're not able to uh, get together and, and uh, take those requests in person. We do have an app that is available on Android, on iPhone, on, on Amazon uh, Internet-capable devices, Heartland Worship Center is all you have to search in your App Store or Google Play. And in, the reason I'm highlighting this tonight is because the largest button in that app is a prayer button. And if you will, if you will uh, tap that button, it gives you an opportunity to fill out a prayer request. And when you submit that, 
that will come straight to our email. Just because there's a distance, a physical distance between us, we still believe in the power of prayer. And so churches, we're out there, and as we're now, especially in this season, as we're in, in engaging individuals that might find themselves in a position of worry or concern, now more than ever, can we speak life and encouragement. Uh, this, this book uh, I mean, this is the instruction book to, to life, you know, and, and it brings freedom. And there's so many folks today that, that need to experience that. And so help us out with that. If you encounter anybody that needs prayer or a situation that uh, you come across that you think uh, we should be lifting up as a church, man, use that app, hit that button and uh, send those prayer requests in. We want to partner with you in prayer in that regard. So tonight we're going to dive into Revelation chapter 14. We're actually in the latter third of that chapter. And so far where we've been uh, has, has been quite uh, exhilarating. Uh, we know that Revelation can be somewhat of a difficult book to study. Oh, absolutely. Uh, just kind of a survey around the table. I know Christy and I went to, um, went to a class specifically for Revelation in Bible college, but what kind of opportunity. Have you guys ever had the opportunity to study Revelation in and of itself? Um, I took a class at AGK Psalm about eschatology. Awesome. But. Awesome. <clears throat> I went through a study, uh, one of the first men's group studies I did before I moved back here from Beloit was the book of Revelations. Awesome. Awesome. So you guys are, had, had some uh, look at it, but, but one of the, it's probably in conversations that I've had, this is one of the books that people kind of I don't want to say turn away from, but there's, there's so much imagery. It's intimidating. It is inti- yeah, that's it's a great word for it, yeah. intimidating. It, there's so much imagery, so much symbolism uh, that is in this book that sometimes we risk missing the point of the book. And that's what I wanted to start out with uh, in just kind of a quick recap. Again, if this is your first time of joining us in this study, in a moment I'm going to highlight on how you can catch up to where we are. But, but this book... Uh, intimidating is, is a great word uh, to use in this. We are getting a taste in Revelation of things to come. Right. In fact, uh, we'll, see, we'll see that here in a moment, that a verse that I'm going to put on the screen. But I never want us to forget what this book is, is about. This is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is the, the central character, the, then, the central theme of the book. As it says right here, the revelation of Jesus Christ was God gave to him to show his servants Again, we see here things which must shortly take place. And he sent and uh, uh, signified it by his angel to his servant, John. Verse 2, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. This is a revelation of Jesus. And Jesus is the central theme of this book. And I never want us to forget that. And one of the things that... um, when I was finishing up my studies at AGTS, one of the things one of my instructors said that has really stuck with me is sometimes we get bogged down in the symbolism or the imagery and we miss that central theme. We try to decipher, you know, well, maybe it's this or maybe it's that. All the while, the biggest thing we've got to remember through Revelation is keep our eyes on Jesus. It's all about Him. It's all about Him. So that's something, again, that I just wanted to kind of quickly recap for us. Uh, that as you read the book of Revelation, keep Christ central right. to that material. So if you, are, if you are first joining us, I know I've, I've hit on this uh, a couple times already. If this is your first time of, of being in our study, my email address, pastorchris at hwcagra.com. Uh, send me an email and I will send you the notes from all of the studies leading up to this point. It'll be a zip file. And uh, we'll uh, get that to you. That way you can have the material that we have looked at leading up to this point. And uh, it's material that's based out of commentaries, different books that we've studied. Uh, but it's, it's stuff that we have developed throughout the years that I think will be a, a big blessing to you. Again, that email address is pastorchris at hwcagra.com. And uh, send me that email. Just make a, uh, maybe in the subject line revelation notes and we'll get those sent to you. Uh, as quickly as we can. All right, so chapter 14. We're getting to a place uh, in Revelation where the harvest is upon us. And so far, Revelation 14, it's revealed some pretty amazing things. Verses 6 through 13, we just looked at this last week in-house on Wednesday night. There were three angels who came to proclaim the message 
Uh, and that message was designed to produce a fear of God leading the lost to a saving faith. And one of the discussion points that we, we ended up actually taking a whole night to talk about was that whole idea of the fear of God and what that word means, that awe, that reverence right. um, that we have towards our Heavenly Father. And so these three angels come on the scene in verses 6 through 13. They give this message and this, this proclamation uh, is, is given. We also see a description of those who came to know Jesus throughout this tribulation. That's backing up a little bit further. Uh, or, or a little bit, it's moving again through chapter 14. Uh, it gives us insight of these individuals on how they lived. Uh, there's a blessing given regarding uh, the life that they lived, that they persevered, that they endured through that season. I mean, talk about a need to persevere in a, in a season such like this, right? I mean, yeah. We're in a time of uncertainty. We're in a time when even <laughs> we, we turn on the news in the morning and we're hearing one story, and then at night we're hearing a completely different story. I mean, it, it can, it's about just enough to make your head spin. Yeah. Uh, but, but through all of this, and, and even, oh man, even as we're talking about Revelation, all these things that are happening, they kept their eyes on Jesus. Mm -hmm. Ooh, I mean, we could, we could just hit that point right there and stay on that through the rest of this. They kept their eyes on Jesus. And because of that, Revelation calls them blessed of how they live. But then also, what's amazing to me in this is it also talks about the blessing and how they died because of their faithfulness, because of their, their commitment, because they stayed in, in Christ uh, we know that uh, their life, in a sense, didn't end just because there was no longer breath in their lungs. Right. They are you know, spending eternity with Jesus Christ yeah. because of the way they lived up to that point. So um, chapter 14 is, a, is a, a, an amazing chapter to study, that's for sure. And now we arrive to what we're going to basically kind of label as the great announcement. Revelation 14, it concludes with a unique illustrative passage of what is to come. The return of Christ is getting close, but there still remains two great trials, and, and we, we see these, these trials illustrated in this text that we're going to look at this evening. One of those trials is the seven bowl judgments, and as we'll see in, in future studies, these seven bowl judgments are severe. I mean, these are, these, these are pretty bad deals that, yeah. that are getting ready to be poured out upon the earth. And then number two, the second trial is Armageddon. And, uh, you know, our culture has somewhat tried to display what Armageddon might look like. In fact, I think there's even a movie about it where asteroids are threatening to hit the earth or something. I don't remember. There's definitely a movie about yeah, it. Yes, definitely a movie about it. So, but, but Revelation, we're going to look at that uh, in depth, the actual Armageddon that uh, Scripture says will take place. Our passage tonight is basically going to highlight these two judgments and kind of give a, a, an overview of what that's going to look like. And again, recall everything that's happening here is taking place as a result of the seventh trumpet. So this is where it would be really advantageous if, if you've not been with us to, to get those notes and, and to read through those. Remember, there's trumpets that will sound, mm -hmm. and in response to each trumpet, there's things that will happen. This is all happening still within the sounding of the seventh trumpet. And that will be the case until Christ returns. So to kind of give us some timeline in all of that um, as we're, again, building up for the material we're about to hit here. So in both of these illustrations that we're going to look at uh, that cover the seven bold judgments and Armageddon, they use an idea of harvest. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's, it's used to convey what's going on here. Now, just kind of get some thoughts around the table. What way, when, when you think of Scripture and you think of the word harvest or you see that word used, what typically comes to mind? Souls. Souls. Okay. Looking, you know, the harvest uh, of you know, people, bringing people to Jesus and, and bringing them to salvation. Right. That's oftentimes what it's describing. Yeah. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Right. That's what comes to my mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The harvest of souls, the need for workers uh, in the field. Um, in fact, the, the church that we grew up in in Garden City, uh, Kansas, used to have the, the text on the wall on a banner talking about the fields being ripe and, and ready for harvest. And, and typically that's, that's the type of thought that would come to mind in most Christian circles when we're dealing with harvest. But Revelation 14, uh, in fact, in, in, in the Fire Bible uh, that I have sitting here, the, the heading on this is, is the harvest of 
the earth. Yeah, I know you're laughing because I just had to plug the fire Bible. It's a great Bible. Get one. Anyway, uh, but uh, the, the, the harvest of the earth, and, and it's going to look a little bit different than what we would normally maybe think in regards, because what we're talking about is what? A positive harvest yeah. for the kingdom of God. What we're going to see here is, is uh, it's, it's a little heavy, mm-hmm. uh, really, when, when, we, when we begin to take it in uh, and considering. So let's, let's talk harvest for just a minute. Pastor Carly, I know your family has been in farming for quite a while and, and such. Uh, I grew up working on a farm. Uh, what all, what's, what, what's all the steps that have to be taken before a harvest can be achieved? I mean, from the very beginning, you bet. You yes, plant, yes, that's right. You plant okay. the wheat. I think wheat harvest. When sure. I think of harvest, um, and and then it sits in the ground for a long time over the winter, and then you know, like all sorts of chemical preparing, keeping the weeds away. Um, but when you get ready for harvest, the thing that that is always in my mind is is everybody in the family is a part of the harvest. Mm. Um, I have terrible allergies, and I drove the truck to the elevator one time. I had a terrible asthma attack on the way home, and um, never never drove the truck again. Um, but I was still part of the harvest, even though I wasn't able to be out in the field and doing that. I was still part of the harvest. I would you know help get meals ready and stuff. So. Um, when I think of, of harvest, I always think of it as being a family affair. That's Everybody awesome. is part of it. That's awesome. That's really cool. It's a good thought. That's a good thought. So yeah, there's the cultivating, the planting, the watering, uh, the nourishment or the, the, the fertilizer, uh, taking care of the weeds, and then, and then comes the day of harvest. So there's a lot of work that goes into play mm-hmm. before you get to that day. A lot of things that happen, but uh, again, I, I love that idea that it's a family, it's, it's all hands on deck type, yeah. type thought there. Um, Again, as we get ready to ju- uh, jump in, and we're going to read Revelation uh, 14, verses 14 through 20 here in just a minute. Both situations um, use this, this illustration of harvest. And uh, each, each one of these situations, again, the, the bold judgments in Armageddon, uh, present three different aspects to harvest. First, there's the reaper. Then there's the ripeness concerning the field. And then there's the actual reaping. So in, in both of these situations, I want you to look for that as we read this, the reaper, the ripeness, and then the actual reaping. So let's look at uh, chapter 14, verses 14 through 20. It says this, I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Then another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud. Take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Verse 16, so he who was seated on the cloud swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. Still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sharp sickle, Take your sharp sickle and gather the cluster of grapes from the earth's vine, because its grapes are ripe. The angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. They were trampled in the winepress outside the city, and the blood flowed out of the presses, rising as high as the horse's bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. Now, immediately, we might sit there and say, well, wait a minute, I didn't see one mention of bowl judgments or one mention of Armageddon. So, Pastor, how in the world are we gathering that that's what this is surveying? Commentators and scholars would agree that this is basically giving us an overview of the effects of of what the earth is going to go through, through the judgments and through Armageddon. And so this is kind of a highlight of what is to come through those items or through those, through those, those trials. And again, in both of those... They are, they are viewed as a harvest. There's a reaper, a ripeness, and a reaping. So we're going to look at this. We're going to start with the first trial, which is the bold judgments. And so we're going to begin with looking at verse 14. Um, I looked, and there before me was a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. Now, I, most of you, I think everybody here is pretty well grown up in Kansas. I moved around quite a bit till I was 12, landed in Kansas uh, at, at that time. But one thing that I can say of this, of this state is 
the weather displays, especially in, and I don't know, we shouldn't celebrate severe weather season, right? But, but man, there are some pretty cool weather displays that, that, that you can view. Uh, sometimes they, they get a little bit too close for comfort, uh, but when they're kind of in a, in a, at a distance, I mean, just, just seeing the, the power of these storms uh, is, is really something to behold. Yeah, seeing something that powerful that looks that beautiful, I mean, when you can see it from a ways off and you can just see, wow, that's awesome. But in the awesomeness, there is some a little bit of uh, fear for how strong strong you know that storm's going to be right it's kind of awesome but stay yeah, over there right, awesome right, right you right, know yeah now in observing i don't you know i've seen some pretty big clouds i've seen some pretty big storms uh i've never seen anything quite like what revelation is describing here uh there before me was a white cloud and seated on the cloud was one like a son of man now this isn't something that he's imagining in the cloud i mean are you following me there there is somebody riding in on right. this cloud, which is a pretty cool thought in and of itself. And, and we know from this text, we are highlighting the reaper. We're looking at, in the seven bold judgments here, who the reaper is. And, and this scripture makes it pretty clear. Uh, this individual was one like a son of man with a crown of gold on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand. We know that this, this reaper is Jesus. Right. So again, think of, think of this, this image, and again, think of where John is in this moment. He is on the island of Patmos, exiled for his faith. Mm-hmm. So I, I know right now we're kind of in an isolation status, you know, because of the, the coronavirus and everything, kind of having to stay to our own homes and things, but we're still able to have contact. We've got right. social media, we've got phones, all these things. John, I mean, he is, he is on this island, um, probably doing hard labor there isolated from anyone um, you know, of the faith. He is on his own right. because of his belief in Christ. And then he gets to see this vision of things to come. I mean, how exhilarating would that be to see your Lord and Savior come riding in on a cloud wearing a crown of victory? I mean, that, that, to me, I don't know. It's, that's that, that imagination going crazy. But here comes the reaper. Here comes Jesus on the cloud uh, waiting for the proper time to stand and to begin reaping as we are reading here. Uh, which again, this is highlighting the seven bowl judgments. His description uh, of the Son of Man, this derives from Daniel's prophecy out of Daniel 7, 13. That text reads, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into His presence. So it's very clear who this is. This is right. Jesus Christ. There's no, there's no way around that. And this is the time, or this is the last time, I find this interesting in Scripture, that refers to Jesus by this title. And it presents kind of a, a contrast with the first time uh, that he is mentioned or calls himself the Son of Man. He does, uh, does this in Matthew 8, uh, verse 20. Uh, and, and he talks about, you'll probably remember the reference when he talks about the Son of Man not having a place to lay his head. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's the first time we see that reference in the New Testament. And now the last time, here he comes basically to harvest the earth to reclaim, you know, what, what is rightfully his in that. He's coming in on a cloud. So we know the reaper is Jesus. Let's look at his mode of transportation, if you will. Um, I, I think of this is pretty doggone awesome because, again, I'm kind of a car guy. I, 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 I like hot rods. You know, I hear, I hear something going down the highway that catches my attention. I got to kind of look out the window. What was that type stuff? Man, this, this, you talk about an attention getter. Sweet ride, Jesus. Sweet ride. That, that, that's right. Probably got the pinstripes. I know. See, now we're getting ourselves in trouble. <laughs> yeah. but, but, that's, but that's, no, think about this again. There are, some, there are some modes of transportation that just command your attention, right? Uh, it's, I mean, seriously. <laughs> I think a cloud would do that. A <laughs> cloud would absolutely do that. Because again, think about this. The awesomeness of an approaching thunderhead. Uh, man, some of these things can tower eight, nine miles high. The, the, the largest... Uh, I thought this was fascinating. The largest storm on record was near Australia. Uh, they measured that thing to be over 12 miles high. 12 miles high. That's like the distance from Phillipsburg to, to Kensington, just a little bit uh, less than that. I mean, that, that's a pretty big thunderhead. And here comes, here comes the Son of Man. Here comes Jesus riding in on this cloud. My point, it's going to get your attention. You're yeah. not going to miss this, this, this thing happening. And so the reaper makes his appearance riding on the cloud, and then he's described 
as wearing a crown of gold upon his head. And for me, this is exciting. This is exciting. This is not, this is not a crown that is worn by a king, but by a victor. It's a crown of victory. It's a crown of triumph. It's a crown of overcoming. Why is this significant? I mean, what are your thoughts? What, what, what does, what, why does that mean something to us today? <clears throat> Jesus is always described, you know, as, as wearing the victor's crown and, and, and having that victory over, you know, sin and the devil. And here he's, you know, riding in symbolizing that. I mean, he's on a cloud, which again is a symbol of him, you know, taming the storm that to us can seem just untouchable because for us it is. And so he's, he's on top of this wearing the crown of victory because you don't get any higher than that. I mean, he's, he's, in, in, in the symbol of coming in, making the statement of being Jesus, being God, and being over all of that thing, having all the authority and power. Yeah, yeah. I think, too, back to what you were saying, the, um, the beginning um, of not having a place to lay his head to, it's just this completion we see mm. from, from nothing to completion, you know, he's died, he's risen, and now he comes to 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 um, complete this entire entire relationship that we have with him, and so it goes from nothing to just he's completing. He's yeah. the right. victor. Yeah. Right. So go ahead. Um, I was going to say, like we talked about, how intimidating storms can be. You know, from afar, you're like, oh, that's really cool. But as it gets closer, it's scary. When you see Jesus riding on the clouds, like he's the victor, it's it's good to be on his side. Sure. You know, like yeah, he, yeah. this store, yeah. this giant cloud comes in. You know, it's it's good to know that the the person in charge of that is is you're on his team. Right? Absolutely, and, and I kind of want to piggyback off of that. So. So we see Christ coming in victory, but what does that mean for us personally who are in Christ? Come on, I see you already fist bumping over. What does it mean? It means that we win. We win, right? <laughs> His victory is our victory, and we're gonna, we see that in our study uh, of grace that we're going through on Sunday mornings. But, but his, as, just as His death has become our death, His resurrection, now we can be you know, raised back to life through Jesus Christ. The Bible says we are more than conquerors, you know, those who are in Christ. I mean... That's it. I go, Christy, man, it's the completion of this yeah. thing. The battle is over. The battle is over. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and again, that's, that's an assurance that we have. Even in this day, as, as we're, we're in this, this season of uncertainty, that we can look to Christ. I mean, obviously, he's, he hasn't come rolling in on the cloud yet, but he's still with us right. today. And we know? know the victory is coming. And the victory is on the way. That's right. And, and John 16, verse 33 uh, is another thing that I, I just want to uh, highlight here as he's talking to his disciples. He says, I have told you these things. He's talking about things to come so that in you or that in me, you may have what? Peace. That's mm -hmm. the word we talked about huge this last Sunday. Peace in this world. I, I love, this is a promise that he makes. In this world, you will have trouble. Well, thanks, Jesus. That's really nice of you. <laughs> uh, you know, but he's he and what I love about our Lord and Savior is that he doesn't he doesn't sugarcoat the truth, man. He presents the truth and then he, he, he finishes it by saying this in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. So in Christ, that hit that overcoming that is applied to our life. We have nothing to fear. We have no concern. The battle has already been won. Jesus wears the victor's crown mm -hmm. and we enjoy the, the benefits of that victory as believers today. And to that, I say, hallelujah. Thank Amen. you, Jesus. Yeah. I mean, that's, just, that's a fantastic scene to behold uh, here in Revelation 14. And then lastly, we notice that the reaper has a sickle in his hand. The scriptures make clear uh, that he's got a razor-sharp instrument for cutting down the harvest at ground level. The picture that we have just seen now is, is, is in a sense, the Lord mowing down his enemies like a harvester that cuts down grain. And I've never had the opportunity to, to, to actually drive or operate a combine, but there's many days of operating a swather, and I do know this. You didn't want to get in the way of that machine no. uh, because as it moved through the field, uh, it was relentless. It was yeah. unforgiving. There was nothing that that machine touched that stayed standing. I mean, as right. long as we kept the blade sharp. But, but, but this, is, this is one of those deals where there's no exemption here. The, the earth will be harvested. Uh, and so there's going to be a mowing down uh, uh, that's coming here soon. So again, let's recap this. The reaper is Christ. He comes riding in on a cloud of his glory, 
wearing a crown of victory, uh, prepared to cut down his enemies. The crown of victory, again, also proclaims the truth. As you mentioned, again, the battle has already been won. So let's move on to the ripeness. Let's look at what, what is ripe, what is to be harvested. This is verse 15 now. Then uh, another angel came out of the temple and called in a loud voice to him who was sitting on the cloud, take your sickle and reap, because the time to reap has come, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So the time has come. The, the, that moment that, that uh, you know, has been waited for, the angel brings the command to execute the harvest. He delivers the message from God to the Son of Man that, is now, that it is now time for Jesus to move in judgment. God's wrath is about to be poured out. And again, just to remember, this is, gonna, this is talking about the seven bold judgments that are going to be mentioned here in chapters to come. And I found, this, I found this to be fascinating. When we look at this word ripe in this, in this verse, uh, the Greek word is serino, um, and it actually means dried up or withered. Now, that's not typically how we think of a harvest. If, if, we, if you consider a harvest, you're getting ready to go to the field and things are dried up or withered. Well, it has to be dry, you know, like, like the plant dies before you harvest sure. it. But yeah, I... I, this may be totally off track, but that's how my brain works, so bear with me. When, when the combine, you know, it cuts everything and it takes out the seed, the wheat, the good part, and it blows the chaff away, this, like, I go from this moment of, yes, Jesus is wearing the victor's crown to, oh my goodness, yeah. all these people who, yeah. who don't know Jesus. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, looking back to what you talked about um, in previous weeks, um, these three angels that, that, that gave the word to, to the entire world. You know, we believe that the, the end time comes when all have had a chance to hear. And I think that's what we're talking about, that ripeness um, through all of God's efforts and, and up to the, yeah. these last three angels that profess the word of God and, and try to instill that fear, that awe of God. The harvest is now ripe. Everybody has had a chance. Everybody has heard the word and made their choice. So I think that's also the part yeah. of that ripeness. Yeah, yeah, and that's huge. And again, because again, as as commentators would look at this, basically with the use of this word, uh, say rhino, uh, the harvest that's pictured here has basically passed the point of any usefulness. Mm. Um, it's it's basically gotten to that point where, like what Christy was saying, that that opportunity has been given time and time and time again, and now we have moved past that era of grace and now into a, a, a time of judgment. And that's a, that's a, that's a hard reality yeah. to swallow. But again, we understand, and I'm, I'm so glad you brought that up because we understand this is all happening after everybody, every soul has had that opportunity to repent and to give their life to Jesus Christ. This is not what Christ wants. This is not what God wants. Mm -hmm. You know, we know the heart of God is that, for, that, that all would repent and, and that all would that, that, that none would perish, as seen in Second Peter three nine, and so that is such a huge point to consider as we look at this. Everybody's had that chance and opportunity, but now that window of opportunity is closed. Um, this is a harvest to rid the world of wickedness. A harvest uh, is good for nothing but the furnace, and that's that's hard to. That's really hard to consider when you think about it. <clears throat> I think it's important to to realize and, and look at it uh, from the aspect of we could feel a little bit bad or a little bit sad here, but like you were saying, they have all had that opportunity. And it's not that they didn't have as good an opportunity. It's that they were cultivated, yeah. they were watered, seeds were planted, and then they chose not to grow. They right. chose not to follow Jesus mm. and, and accept that. So it's it's tough, but it's not that, you know, that they just didn't get the opportunities. They had the opportunities and then and then chose, as we choose and have to choose to follow Jesus, they mm. made the choice not to. Yeah, and see, that takes my mind right back to the uh, to the illustration that Christ himself gave dealing with the, the different types of soil that the seed mm -hmm. would land on, you know, and, and so how amazing is that, you know, that we see, we see the results, you right. know what I mean, of, yeah. of, of that uh, coming to play. Um, and again, you could see that, that, that at this point, we, we believe that the church will have been raptured, removed mm -hmm. from this scene, and now we see the results of, of, of where the seed has been uh, 
uh, well, just not well nourished. It never did, really took hold. And mm-hmm. so here comes that, here comes that uh, judgment uh, poured out upon him. So the ripeness, uh, the earth is what is to be harvested, and it's because of the wickedness that, is, uh, that it has taken hold of hearts. And then last but not least, we see the actual reaping in verse 16. It says, so he who was seated on the cloud, who is Christ, we know this tonight, swung his sickle over the earth, and the earth was harvested. Detailed for us in, in Revelation chapter 16, that's where we're going to see the bold judgments that we keep uh, highlighting. Uh, we see a rapid fire process that marked the first phase of the final reaping. And we're going to study those judgments in detail here in the near future. But one thing I see in this, this scripture that, that the word makes clear, uh, he was seated, seated on the cloud, that's Christ, uh, swung his sickle. And in this last statement, the earth was harvested. That's a statement of matter of fact. That's a statement that, that, that it, it's not might be. Uh, it, it wasn't suggested. It was harvested. This will come to pass. Uh, nothing could stop the sickle in the hands uh, that was in uh, the hands of the Lord. Again, as, we, as we're getting ready to, uh, to continue in our journey in, in Revelation, verse, or chapter 16, we'll begin to highlight the seven bowls, uh, those seven ju- judgment bowls. They will prove to be devastating to the earth and its inhabitants. And this, again, is it's judgment, it's wrath, it's the fulfillment of the consequence that comes with the rejection of sin. And I think time and time again through Scripture, it has warned us that the wages of sin mm-hmm. is death. Right. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And I think it's important to realize that, like, Jesus, this isn't what he wants, you know, he right. doesn't want us to be separate from him. And imagine how devastating it is for him to to bring that to completion, to yeah. say this is the end and this has to happen. Um, but I mean, I mean, how far did he go for folks to make yeah, this Yeah, exactly. I mean, he gave his life. Exactly. To, and, to give people the choice not to find themselves in that position. Sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to... No, you're fine. Um, and I think that sometimes when we envision this, you know, we, we see the victory, we see that, but we also need to look at the heart of God in that up until this point, he told us this point was coming right. for a reason, right. because he, his desire is that none should perish and be separated from him. So that's just... Yeah, no, that's, that's powerful, very powerful. And so we, we see the reaping now. So for, for the bold judgments, we've seen the reaper who is Christ. We've seen the ripeness, which is the earth, and then we see the reaping, that this is, this is fulfilled, that those judgments will take place. That, so far, has encompassed the seven bold judgments. Now we see trial number two, okay. which we know is Armageddon. And, and we jump into that in verse 17. It says, Another angel came out of the temple in heaven, and he too had a sharp sickle. So here comes the second reaper, if you will, in this passage of Scripture. And this time, this reaper is, is a different individual. It's an angel. Uh, carrying a large sickle. He is prepared to reap uh, the harvest. And again, it shouldn't come as a surprise to us tonight that Jesus uh, uses angels to assist him in the final judgment. Um, This is something we've seen angels uh, about the business of God throughout all of Scripture. Uh, But here in this situation, we see an angel used in uh, the final judgment of the earth. So we know the reaper in this case with Armageddon is an angel. Then we see the ripeness presented in verse 18. It says, still another angel who had charge of the fire came from the altar and called in a loud voice to him who had the sickle. Take your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of grapes from the earth's vine because its grapes are ripe. Now this is, this is a little bit of a different situation. So we, we've got angel number one who is the reaper. Now, angel number two, uh, who is in charge of the fire, uh, comes on the scene. Where does he come from? The altar. He comes from the altar. Now, uh, again, we're going to look at the significance of this here in, in just a moment. So angel one, the reaper, angel two, who is over fire, uh, comes from the altar and in a loud voice basically gives the command to begin the reaping process because the, the uh, grapes uh, are, are ripe, as, as we're seeing in this illustration. Now, unlike the angel in verse 17, um, this angel does not come from the throne of God, again, comes from the altar. 
that is associated with the prayers of the saints. Now, do we know what those prayers were earlier in Revelation? Anybody know? See, these guys are always there. Well, go ahead. Well, it was the angel, the, those prayers were to be, um, what's the word? To be avenged. They were, you know, the saints that had been martyred for the name of Jesus. Right. So, right. So early on in Revelation, we see a cry from the saints uh, that, that are, are, their prayers are for, uh, for there to be justice in a sense, mm-hmm. to, uh, to be uh, taken for, you know, the, the, the persecution, the, the wrongdoings that were brought their way. And, and again, this is, is now, in a sense, an answer to those prayers. Um, the angel coming from the altar that is associated with the prayers of the saints, his appearance means that the time has come for those prayers to be answered. We, we believe in the power of prayer. We say this all the time here at HWC. We also believe that God answers every prayer. And here again, we begin to see that answering ha- uh, happening. They suffered martyrdom, uh, and that, that suffering did not go unnoticed. Uh, and, and now is a time of justice, a time of accountability for those who had brought harm uh, to God's people, to God's kingdom. And again, that might be difficult in, in receiving because, again, we think of God as loving, grace, merciful, mm-hmm. uh, all these things, but never forget that God is also just. Right. Uh, go ahead, Scott. And I think it's important in that, and when it's you know, kind of difficult to receive, is had they chosen... Somewhere in here, Jesus paid. He was absolutely his death on the cross was the payment. It was the um, vengeance that they were looking for. But we're now coming down to these are the ones that didn't allow Jesus to pay that price for their sin and for the mistakes that they had made. And and, and so now they're they're facing the judgment. Absolutely. And there's certainly a reason why we're given this, right, and that right. that goes back to that. Like, not only have we been given opportunity to know Jesus, but we have we have the end written right. down for us yeah. of what is coming. Right. Again, the truth will, I mean, truly set you free. If, if, mm-hmm. if a person would come to the Word of God and read that from, from Genesis to Revelation, see the redemptive plan that God has laid out, God hasn't hidden anything from right. us. I mean, He's been very clear from the beginning. I mean, clear back in Genesis, the first warning ever given, you know, don't, don't disobey, don't do mm-hmm. against my, my, my Word. And, and again, that's exactly where the enemy goes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, but he also tells us the end of the story. Hey, this is what's coming. Um, but in between the beginning and the end is Jesus right, and the crucifixion. I mean, it's, it's, the, it's the, the, the climax point of the, the, the plot of the story, if you will, that in Christ, again, going back to that victory, we don't have to, we don't have to go through this. And even if, even if we do suffer at the hands of others in this life because of our faith, this might sound weird. To that, I say praise God because I want to remain faithful through all things. Yeah. But there is coming a time when judgment and accountability will come to those who bring harm against God's people. Mm-hmm. It should they choose not to repent and come in Christ. My prayer is for everybody, everybody to come and know Jesus. The, the persecutor, uh, the, you know, well, look at Paul. Okay, now we're off on a rabbit trail. This happens often on Wednesday nights, so just bear with me. Look at Paul, formerly known as Saul. This guy breathed murderous threats against the church. I mean, his, his whole objective was to shut down the influence of this, of this new fledgling faith that was beginning to, to just spread like wildfire. And in fact, with Stephen, as Stephen was being stoned for his faith, as his life was ended uh, for his, his commitment to Christ, Saul stood in approval. Scripture tells us that they, they put, laid, laid their coats at his feet. He was there observing this. This, uh, this happened, and I can't help but think that in that moment, that maybe in his mind he's thinking, what would devote this guy? What, what kind of, what, what, what kind of uh, uh, oh, I don't know what the right words would be. He, he's watching Stephen give his life for, for what Saul had come into this thing thinking was a false religion. I mean, he is seeing a devotion, a commitment like no other, and I can't help but think that in that moment, Scripture doesn't tell us that, but maybe the wheels began to turn in Saul's mind thinking, hmm, what's going on? We see it as a moment of judgment, but could God have already been working in his heart at that moment? Because then on that road to Damascus, man, we see that, that, rem- that remarkable yeah. turnaround. Christ appears, his life is changed, and he moves from persecutor to persecuted. He moves from being somebody that was trying to kill the church to somebody 
I mean, who literally wrote most of the New Testament. Go ahead, guys. Um, I think that you have a good point in that Saul, he saw in Stephen something powerful. Yes. And, and that was why I would imagine that he went so hard against Christianity because he's like, this is threatening everything um, about my religion and my life. And I'm looking at this guy who's giving his life, who's looking up and claiming to see heaven. Like this is powerful. And if it's powerful to me who I grew up this way and I know better then I've got to stop this. Um, and, and I think about like even being able to see the power in that when he thinks that it's all just, you know, crazy or he, he doesn't believe it. It's against what he believes. Um, that you're right. That that started something in Saul that, that Jesus used. And I want to jump on that because I recently heard somebody say, or kind of describe, uh, God as the great interrupter, yes. that God has a, as a way of interrupting us, uh, in our lives. And in that moment, Notice, okay, so Saul views this, this devotion in Stephen. He sees this commitment in Stephen that possibly threatens his way of life, mm -hmm. right? And it wasn't until Christ comes on the road to Damascus and there's that interruption, mm -hmm. right? And so how many people in this world, I wonder, and again, this is just, we're just table talk here, have, have rejected God because they don't want life as they know it interrupted. Yet, here's the, here's the thing. God, in this moment, is trying to interrupt our life with grace, yeah. with love, right, with mercy. He's given his son for, for all of us. But we know that at some point there will, become a, there will come an interruption mm -hmm. that you cannot stop, you won't, that, that is one of you judgment and of wrath. Yeah. And so I just implore you, hear the interruption of grace tonight. Hear the interruption of love that he gave his life for you, you know, so that, that all of this that we're talking about, the bold judgments, Armageddon, that you wouldn't be a part of that, but instead, starting today, yeah. you would enjoy the fullness mm -hmm. of his grace, his mercy, and his love. Yeah. And we, we, we worry about that interruption, that, that effect it's going to have on the life we live, because we, we think that, you know, we got to change something in us. We gotta I have different. a plan. Yeah. God, I have a plan. It's right. a good plan. I yeah. like my plan. Yeah. Please don't right. interrupt my right. plan. Thank right. you very much. Right. And his grace is, I mean, he's going to come in there and, and he, we don't even know he might've given us that plan and, and, and he might come in and walk alongside us or he may come in and change your name to uh, Paul from Saul, but ultimately it is good. And, and the Bible tells us over and over that it, no matter what happens, even if we face trials that we've talked about already here and, and face some storms in this life after we accept him, that ultimately we can see now because he's given us the whole picture that we have good. Good will come of it even sure. if we suffer every day of our earthly life, which that's not, he doesn't call us to a life of suffering. But even if we did, we, we have that grace and we have knowing that that we're going to be, you know, swept up previously in, in, in some of the earlier stuff in Revelation, and, and we have an eternity in heaven. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, it's so important to remember that God's desire is that none perish. Right. Yeah. God doesn't want any grapes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. so um, he, he tries diligently and through general revelation and specific revelation to, to show us something yeah. better. But we still have the choice to be the grape or to be the life. Right. Yeah, yeah. And here I want to point out something too in, in this text. Okay, so in our, our, our previous text where it talked about the harvest, uh, we looked at the word, the Greek word, that, that meant basically the harvest was dried up, it was useless. Now in this, in this particular situation, the word is akmazo, uh, and this refers to something that is fully ripe and in its prime. And in this case, we might, well, hey, that's, that's a good thing, right? But yet... We're going to see why that's kind of a bad thing um, here in a moment when dealing with this. In, in a sense, what this text is telling us is the wickedness, the, the, the people of this earth, uh, and this might sound kind of funny, but they are bursting with the juice of wickedness and are ready for harvest. And we're going to see that harvest come uh, as, as we, we move on here in verses 19 through 20. It says this, the angel swung his sickle on the earth, gathered its grapes, and threw them into the great winepress of God's wrath. Something that I think is important to pause for just a moment in reading this. Whose wrath is this? God. This is God's wrath. God is in control of this scene. Mm -hmm. And again, people might look at that and say, man, this just seems heavy. This just seems... Remember, Christ 
Christ has been given to us, mm -hmm. that this may not become our reality. Right. God is telling us the things to come, but the answer is already before us. His name is Jesus. So this is God's wrath, verse 20. They were trampled in the wine press. What is it that's being trampled? The grapes that have been harvested. They were trampled outside the city, and the blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horses' bridles for a distance of 1,600 stadia. Now, I think it's significant, again, so we, we see the illustration of grapes being used, but then in verse 20, reality sets into what's happening. Mm -hmm. And we're not talking about making wine here. We are talking about the trampling of wickedness. We are talking about judgment. And verse 20 makes clear, blood flowed out of the press, rising as high as the horse's bridle. That's pretty tall. So if you consider that's, that you're talking about a four and a half, five foot maybe uh, height here uh, for a distance of 1,600 Stadia. This is a terrible scene of tragedy. Mm -hmm. Armageddon is, is horrific. It's, it's not, nothing to be joked about. I know, again, Hollywood has, has tried to use that term in, in different ways, you know, to mm -hmm. make these dramatic movies or whatever. But the people who survived the bold, uh, the bold judgments that we talked about a moment ago are now facing war. And again, it's like that trampling effect in a wine press. How does that work? There's two stone basins. Uh, that are connected with a trough. One basin was used to crush the grapes, the other to collect the juice. And the Bible is very clear. This, is, this isn't really a battle. This is a slaughter. Mm -hmm. This, is, this is, isn't really a fight. You know, I kind of think of it in this, in this sense. When, when you're talking the difference between light and darkness, the moment the light is turned on, the darkness has to flee. It, it, it's not like you see this battle where the darkness is pushing back. That's not the case at all. And in this situation, it's more of a slaughter. It will literally be a bloodbath. Um, again, this, this scripture tells us, rising as high as four to five feet, uh, what's 1,600 stadia? Over 200, well, around 200 miles. That's a pretty big distance. You're talking, you're talking a massive, massive amount, a massive volume uh, of blood. Some would look at this and say, well, this is illustrative. This is more uh, uh, talk just to try to get people's attention. Others would take it literally. But here's the case. Whatever, whatever this is, as far as the, the depth and the, the wide spread of, of the blood, we know that millions will engage in the battle against Christ, but Christ will prevail. Yeah. Wickedness has no chance against the righteousness of our God. Amen. And I think, you know, back to the whole purpose of that, um, all the martyrs, you know, all those that were persecuted for their faith, that blood um, will avenge them, and that, that just brings that fourfold, you know, back around that that it, God will fully answer their prayers. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Scott, were you going to say something? I, I was just going to say that that um, it, it's key to remember, you know, in all of this that whether it's descriptive or whether it's literal. Uh, you know, it's that edge of that cliff that sometimes I use as an illustration to talk about, you know, how close we get. Literally or figuratively, it's not something you want to stay, get Absolutely. even close to. And, right. But luckily, we don't have to. As we yeah. opened right. up with, this is all centered around Jesus and, and that salvation and all of that. We don't have to, you know, worry about this. This is description, you know, get our attention, whatever, but... It, let it refocus you on the fact that we have Jesus and Absolutely. that we can be saved and spared from even having to worry about whether it's literal or figurative. Right. Go ahead. Um, and like Christy said, God doesn't want any grapes. That's all I can think. But, but there are going to be grapes. Right. Sure. Sure. And that's but the don't sad. Don't be a grape. Don't, don't be, a, be grape. a grape. That's right. I, it, it, that's the big takeaway for today. Yeah. Don't be a grape. But I mean, but here's here's the thing. That's and that's the sad reality of this is that in God. Or God, through His Son, Jesus Christ, has literally given us mm -hmm. everything. Yeah, amen. You know, we say it often here at HWC that if you are in Christ, you have everything that you need. And that is so true. That is so true. You know, especially in days like today, when it seems like fear and panic are, are rampant. Listen, even as we read this book of judgment and wrath, we can kind of have this, this, this sigh of relief knowing that if we are in Christ... We have everything that we need. We don't have to worry about this because our sins have been forgiven. And if you're watching this and if you, you haven't had that opportunity to give your heart to Jesus, we're going to have that opportunity here in the next couple of minutes. But, but he gave his life 
so that we didn't have to go through judgment and wrath. He, 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 his blood became that atonement for our sins. That, that price has been paid in full. And that's, that, that shows us the, the depth of God's love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If we're really true about this picture, every one of us deserves yeah. mm-hmm. what we just read, the, the, the bold judgments in Armageddon. Mm-hmm. Every person that has sinned, and that's every person that's ever walked this earth, deserves to face that kind of judgment and wrath because God himself gave us the instruction before sin ever entered this world, don't touch it. Mm-hmm. It will bring death. Yeah. It will bring suffering. And yet, through the influence of the enemy, through the serpent in Genesis, mankind fell into that trap. God didn't leave us there. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. That death that was, that was spoken of, he has died that death. And through Christ, we can be raised back to new life. And again, we don't have to wait for eternity to begin to experience that new life. We can Amen. experience it right now. Even in the midst of a pandemic sweeping this world, we don't have to fear. We don't have to worry because in Christ, we have everything that we need. And so that is so important that we remember that as we, as we conclude for, uh, chapter 14. Were you going to shout? I, 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 no. Uh, everything in my life is related to the Lion King right now, so we won't go down that route. There you trail, go. But. There you go. There you go. I, I imagine Valerie and Lacey's got you guys watching. Yes. yes. So, sorry. That's why I'm laughing to myself. I'm thinking of, oh, the Lion King. This is a great analogy, but we won't, we won't do there that. There you go. There you go. Well, Revelation 14, what we've been covering, it concludes with this picture of harvest that is yet to come. It's not a pleasant picture. We understand that. You know, most of the time when we see pictures online of harvest, it's combines, it's sunsets, it's, it's fields getting... It's the most wonderful time of the year. It's the most wonderful time of the year. Um, this picture of harvest, of the bull judgments of Armageddon, it's not a pretty one. No. Why? Again, because the wages of sin is death. It always has been, always wills, uh, will be. Sin carries with it a tremendous consequence and just real quick before we completely close it out and, and kind of bring it back um, i'm just feeling uh, uh some you know empathy and compassion for jesus because when it when we read the description of the cross and and he took the weight of our sins he took that kind of pain oh, you absolutely. know the, the the battle that it describes and and the you know the punishment and and we we fear isolation and all that he was absolutely more isolated than we can ever understand oh, man, yeah. and in pain and hurt for our sins. He, all that stuff that we're talking about can be overwhelming and we can worry about. He felt that mm-hmm. for yeah. us. And so I'm just, uh, it, 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 you know, puts a new perspective and, and really brings in the, the sacrifice he made so that yeah. I don't have to worry about going through That's that. Right. Well, as it says in Isaiah, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised absolutely. for our iniquities. If you go back a little bit further, it talks about that, that the chastisement that was on his shoulders, that, that, that was meant for us. Mm. All of this was meant for us, but Christ bore it on his shoulders. Yeah. And in him and through his sacrifice, we can be saved. I mean, it brings kind right. of a whole new meaning to that word, mm-hmm. saved. Yeah. Absolutely. As we talk about that tonight, not only from things of today, but for things that are, are yet to come. Uh, and again, that's what makes that victor's crown to me so, so amazing that he has yeah. overcome the world and that in Christ we too can become overcomers. And that's where I want to go. As, as we've been talking about this, as Christ is the central theme in all of this, I just want to make opportunity, if you're watching this tonight and you do not have a relationship with Jesus, I imagine this can be some heavy material to digest, to kind of consider. But then again, we've known that the wages of sin is death. Mm-hmm. And we don't have to wait for the bold judgments or for Armageddon to experience the death consequence of sin. And there may be some watching tonight that you know exactly what I'm talking about. You're walking through some trials. You're walking through some hardships that you need deliverance from. Let me tell you something. The name of the deliverer is Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And he has given his life on the cross that you might be saved, that you might experience forgiveness of all sin and walk in his newness and grace. And so what I want to do with you, I want to pray. If you're watching this tonight and you, you are wanting to make a decision to follow Jesus, to give your life to Christ, I want you to bow your heart and bow your head, and we're going to join you at this table, and we're going to pray tonight, and I want you to say these words after me, and uh, I want you to pray these things with all your heart, because we're, what we're talking about here is a relationship, not a religion. Yeah. We're talking about, about knowing Christ, not just going through motions, doing what we're, we think we're supposed to do, instead following who 
we're supposed to follow, becoming Christ-like, becoming, uh, uh, you know, allowing God to, to make us new through His Holy Spirit and through His Word. So would you bow your heart with me? And, and uh, uh, if you want to give your heart to Jesus tonight, I, I want you just to say this prayer with me this evening. Say, Dear Jesus, I know I have sinned. I know I have messed up. But I also know that you gave your life on the cross for my sins. Forgive me, Lord, of all my wrongdoings. Come into my life. Make me whole again. Help me, Father, in everything I say and in everything I do. Because from this moment, I'm no longer chasing the things of this world, but I am pursuing the ways of your word. Holy Spirit, guide and direct my life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. Listen, if you just prayed that prayer with all your heart, one, I just want to say, awesome. That is so cool. The greatest decision you could ever make in this life is to decide to follow Jesus Christ. And two, we as a church want to get with you and help you in this new journey. Uh, reach out to us, email, Facebook, uh, stop by the office sometime. We want to connect with you and put some discipleship material in your hands to help you in that journey as you grow closer to God. Uh, but we're so glad that you're watching tonight. So thankful for this, this group. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, yeah, a little absolutely. bit different, a little bit out of the box. Uh, but uh, Lord willing, uh, we'll be back here at HWC as quickly as we can. But as long as we're online, Wednesday nights, 7 o'clock, don't miss out on our Revelation discussion. But we love you guys so much. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you this Sunday at 1050. God bless you.